chess and go programmer. He is even the author of the free open source chess and chess variants engine, Sheng, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know the word, but, well, he is very, very famous in chess coding. The other guy is Chris Lord. So Chris was already here last year, but we are more than happy he has accepted to come again. And Chris is a Firefox for Android programmer, um, video game writer in his spare time. He is famous in the London office for calculating his weight in stones, like hobbits. <laughs> so, um, Together, they provide an overview of what happened with Firefox for Android in the past year. What features did we add? What performance improvements did we achieve? What usability improvements we made? And what entertaining stories we can tell from that experience? Also, where did we fail? Well, because sometimes we fail. Uh, where are we still aiming to improve? So please welcome Chris and Giancarlo. So hello everyone, um, I was just introduced, I'm Giancarlo Pascuto, this is Chris Lord. We're both Firefox platform engineers working mostly on Firefox for Android. Uh, if you want to find us, we boot Twitter very regularly and we hang out in a mobile channel on Mozilla IRC. So when I was preparing this talk, I took last year's slides because I want to have some idea what to talk about. And I noticed that actually last year we already gave uh, quite an extensive presentation what we would do in the future. So I didn't have so much to talk about because we already covered it last year. But I was a bit lazy and I just copy pasted the slides from last year and, I, and then I went through them and I sort of corrected what happened and what didn't happen. So first thing, uh, the start page. This is when you start up Firefox, the first thing you see, it's an important entry port for the application, so it's important to get it right. Uh, last year, we were planning to redesign it with the top sides view, nice Firefox logo, and some ability to edit stuff on there or like uh, lock top sides in place. So what we ended up developing, actually, at some point, it, it looked pretty much like the, the thing you see on the right, but we already iterated it once, because as I said, it's the more, most important part of the application, so we really want to get it right. So we, we did something that's a bit more uh, closer to the hollow design guidelines from Android. We got rid of the Firefox logo because even though it looks pretty, it's not actually doing anything and there's not all that much screen real estate on a phone. And uh, aside from the top sides view, we also have, have several, I'm not sure how to call them tabs, but uh, views where you can swipe in between and go between your top sides, your bookmarks, your history, or your reading list. Okay, so that's a continuation. You can edit and pin site like we foresaw, but you also want to be able to like open tabs and open stuff in new private tabs. Private browsing. Uh, we planned this last year. We more or less implemented it exactly as designed, so the screenshot is still actual. Um, in Firefox or Android, the, the private browsing is per, per tab, not like in desktop where it's a really separate window. In terms of, of usability on a phone, uh, this, this works a bit better, whereas on desktop, having a private window is a bit more clear. New tabs UI. So we, we changed the way you navigate through tabs. This is a screenshot of a seven inch tablet, actually, where you have a horizontal strip with uh, thumbnails, actually, of the current uh, sites that are loaded there. One thing which we're still working on is you, you can see the icons in the to on the top with the selection. The left one's the regular tabs, the middle one's the, the private tabs, and the right one are the tabs that are synced from your other devices. We're still not entirely clear on this one. We, at some point, we actually tried putting text in there to make it clearer what those different things are, but it, that turns out to be a real nightmare when you try to internationalize it, because some languages have like really long words and then it doesn't fit on the screen anymore. So we went back to icons, although I'm not saying this is uh, the finished, what we will keep doing. Yeah, so that's what we were planning to do, that's what we ended up doing. As you can see, that's a pretty close match. 
On a phone, um, it's a bit different. Uh, again, due to limitations of the, you, you mostly use a phone in portrait, for example. It's a generally smaller resolution, so we, we actually use more room to, to show you the different tabs, and it's a vertical view. On the tablet, um, we actually postponed doing a lot of work for the tablet uh, UI. Last year, we, we just redid the tablet UI as one of the latest things, so we didn't think it was as needed. We're fairly happy what we have on there. I think only like the stuff for, for private tabs was, was added and tweaked a little bit, but it's still generally more or less the same. One thing we did was to make the, the tabs drawer slide open and close uh, by automatically. But that turns out that not everyone likes that, we, so we still have to add like, some way to lock that in place or to, to make that uh, customizable. Fonts. So um, on a mobile device, well, most web pages like, specify why well, I want to have a serif font or a sans serif font. Some specifically say that they want a specific font, but not all of them do. And if a font has a, just a generic request to use a serif font, there, there's some opportunities there. We, we found that some mobile devices have, um, are modified by the vendor to have a bit more Unicode support because they sell in more countries or they want to better support some countries. And in some cases, those fonts have like broken font metrics. There's also a bit of a movement on the web to like start including your own fonts in your web page. And we decided last year already that we wanted to bundle some, some good mo fonts with Firefox or Android that are really work well on a mobile device uh, on a small high DPI screen. And we were originally planning to use Open Sans, which is, was made by Google for more or less that purpose. But actually during the year, um, Intel came out with their own font, which was Clear Sans. And we evaluated them, them carefully. And our conclusion was that Clear Sans is actually better than Open Sans. So we didn't end up bundling Open Sans, but we shipped Clear Sans. Um, it's probably not going to be very clear on this projection because it's, it's a very big view, whereas the fonts are really optimized for small screens. Um, so I'm not sure if my slides will come out that well, but you can probably already see a bit here um, that, for example, the open sans, they're, they're in increasing boldness. And like the only difference you see really is that the last one is very bold and the other three have almost no differences. Whereas in clear sans, um, it's, it's slightly better, although I have to say on, on the projector, it, doesn't really come out as well either. And another f uh, serif font that we added was Sherry SEL, because we also found that was a really good font, which had a license that was usable for us. So for example, this is the Google home page. Um, left is the default view, right is the view with um, uh, the clear sounds. Um, again, it's, it doesn't really come out that well on a projector, but in reality, if you would try this on your phone, you would see that the right page is way more readable, and in my opinion, the font also is slightly more playful. So this is reader mode. Um, again, you, here you can see the difference a little bit better. Um, well, here it's even better, I think. Yeah. So the, the right view is uh, the new reader mode, where you can actually now switch between the serif font and the sans serif font, which we didn't allow before, and left is how it uh, used to look before. So again, on a phone, you should find that this is slightly more readable and looks slightly better. Open web apps. I think the last talk sort of uh, went into this, so we wanted to integrate the Firefox Marketplace into Firefox for Android. Here's how it looks right now. Um, so you can just click on there, uh, the, the, the applications are listed, this is a free app, so you could just click on message me, install it, and then you get a real nice icon on your desktop, so you just click on your, um, your phone homepage and you launch the web app seamlessly. WebRTC. Um, you might wonder why this is coming back, because last year at FOSDEM, somebody already demoed a WebRTC call from uh, the phone to the browser. But honestly, there's some difference between a demo where you have like, a, you know exactly which phone you're using, you're, you know the application you're working with. Um, whereas in reality, we made WebRTC so people could build everything and have it work on every possible phone. So there was quite a bit of work to do to stabilize everything. Uh, we support WebRTC on every phone where we support Firefox, which means going back to Android 2.2. Um, reality is that Android didn't get all the right APIs to make this work perfectly until 
Android 4.2. Um, it's probably going to work quite well starting from ice cream sandwich, but um, your experience may vary depending on the exact device you have. Yeah, that's another slide. Um, so WebRTC is also still a bit of an evolving standard. So this picture was taken when I was in Boston for a WebRTC meeting at, I think, the worst possible time because they got like the, bad, the worst snowstorm in 50 years and I got stuck there. Um, you might be wondering what's wrong with this picture. Well, as it turns out that you can actually capture the raw image data from an Android phone, but all those phones, or basically almost all phones, have the, have the camera rotated sideways. And as it turns out, there's no way from within Android to ro rotate the image the right way. So what every Android application does is they actually just swap it back on display. But if you're, you want to send the video image, preferably without converting it 20 times to a remote uh, client, which may be running Chrome, that's not really an option. So we, we had to fix this as well. And what happened here is that Twitter apparently didn't do this, and then this happens. Web APIs. So we had big plans to implement a lot of stuff. Um, that's somewhere where we, I wouldn't say it completely failed, but it didn't really go as planned. Uh, we want to implement the GamePad API. This didn't happen. I, I didn't really find any good reason why that didn't happen, so my conclusion is that nobody at Mozilla likes games or doesn't play games or anything. Telephony, we could have done that, but the Android permissions model right now is that we must request every permission that we could possibly need at the moment you install your phone. And that really conflicts with Mozilla being a privacy conscious uh, company because if you would want to implement telephony APIs, then Firefox, the moment you would have to install it, would have to request like basically every permission imaginable, including quite a few that are that our user base would go nuts over, I think. It's already a bit bad with WebRTC that we ask for questions to like take pictures and people are like, why does Firefox have to take pictures? Push notifications, yeah, as it turns out, that's that's like more useful for, I think, Firefox OS um, than it is on Android. And I think the specification also didn't finish in time. All right, Chris, your turn. Hello, there we go, cool. So this is something I think I presented last year and said it was coming soon, kind of thing, and kind of one short year later and kind of 70, 80 bugs, and we have it in, which is a bit, uh, that was a fun time. So this is a, a feature where, as you can see, kind of the UI gets out of your way. It's meant to be a distraction-free UI, so it lets you concentrate more on the, the content of the page. And we're now working on the feature to let you turn it off as well. So that will be coming soon, hopefully a bit sooner than it took to implement in the first place. So we now, uh, I think we presented this last year as well. We, had, we were doing nightly builds for x86 devices. Uh, we now, that's trickled down into the Google Play Store now. So you can run Firefox release on kind of one of the two or three x86 Android devices that are available. So if you've kind of mistakenly bought one of those, then we've got your back. Uh, so for, for Canvas, we, we kind of did a lot of, we wanted to make it work well for games, so we did a lot of optimization work. So one of the big changes that we made last year was uh, we switched from the back-end renderer using Cairo to using Skia, which that alone was quite a speed up. But on top of that, uh, we now have hardware selection. So in kind of selected cases, mostly in the kind of cases that games use, um, you'll have a GL accelerated canvas as opposed to a software rendered canvas. And that kind of brings us closer, at least, to parity with, say, Chrome and other WebKit-based Android browsers. Um, we also made some improvements with the way WebGL gets to the screen. It was, I mean, given it's quite a raw API, there's not really much we can do to optimize it. But um, I, I think now we should we should kind of be pretty much top of class when it comes to WebGL apps in performance. I mean, you basically, at that point, like we have the minimal kind of get to screen route, and then, then it's kind of down to JS performance where we're, we're pretty good. So low precision rendering was a feature mainly for low-end Android phones. Um, so it gives us the option where basically if we fall behind on rendering, say you have a slow phone or there's a site that takes a particularly slow path through our code or something, um, we can temporarily sacrifice rendering resolution and 
then get uh, better rendering speed. So the idea is that you're never going to see nothing when you scroll down the page. It's kind of, you might see a low resolution rendering for a short period and then we quickly catch up and render it in high resolution. That's, but that's mainly for low-end devices. Ideally, you'll never see this feature, but you probably will. So this is, um, I mean, maybe it shouldn't have had its own slide kind of thing, but <laughs> we render now in high color by default. I mean, the Android ecosystem, or the device ecosystem, rather, changed quite dramatically over the last year. So whereas last year it was pretty common for Android, so kind of mid to low end devices to have not so much RAM, not, maybe not such a great screen. So you might not even have a screen that can display 24 bit color, never mind having enough RAM to actually render a page. But um, that's completely different now. Um, most phones, even the lowest end of phones now, you have certainly, you've got a high color screen, you've got a pretty reasonable screen as well, and you've got enough RAM that you can render in high color by default. So when, when the hardware allows us to, we do. And if you don't like that, you can switch that back in about config as well. So you can see the difference can, well, you can barely see the difference there, but it, if you saw it on this screen, it's pretty dramatic. Like it can be quite dramatic in certain cases, usually where there's color gradients. So back to Jen Carter. All right. Back on. One, two, three. All right. So Java add-ons. Um, so one problem we have on mobile is that we don't support Xul. So like traditional desktop add-ons which use Xul to have a UI won't work on, on Firefox for Android because we use Java for Android UIs. Um, we have a possibility now already to include a Java class file with your add-on. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't really get to like defining APIs to hook into our, our UI which means if you would try to use this, you would have to use reflection and then probably everything would break uh, as soon as we change something in our UI. So this is, I would say, largely unfinished. Uh, you can use Java for some things, but I think we really have some work to do there until it's really usable. Then some minor and less minor features we added, um, H.264 decoding, using your uh, device's decoder if you're unfortunate enough to use patented stuff. Uh, application not responding reporter. What, well, if Firefox crashes, we will know about it. If Firefox hangs, we didn't know about it. So we built something that allows us to track uh, if the browser just gets stuck instead of really crashing. Firefox health report. Um, basically, the idea, the idea there is that we track some performance stuff, and then if we see something that's a problem for our users, then we can respond to it, or even like pop up a hint to our users that they they have a problem and that they can get a better performance by fixing it. We finished all the backend parts of that, but the UI of Firefox Health Report isn't finished. This is actually really burning us right now because Adblock Plus is sort of broken on mobile and takes like 10 seconds to start up. So everybody's starting to complain like, why is Firefox or Android so slow? But it's actually Adblock. And if this would have been finished, we would have been able to tell those people, but it isn't. So you have a bit of a problem there. Uh, reader mode improvements, uh, I uh, talked a little bit about that. You have some more options. You can change the fonts. Search engine UI, you can change the default search engine and stuff like that. Quick share, I'll sh show uh, a picture of that. Uh, Podio support, ASMJS support on ARM, mixed content warnings, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Quick share, so if you quickly want to share a web page uh, or, or actually some text with someone else, there's the right button which allows you to select everything on your device that has a share intent, and it remembers the last one. So in my case, I sent something to Dropbox, and I got a Dropbox icon there. Guest browsing, so you have a tablet, and but you have a, you have a friend at your home, and he quickly wants to look something up. So you can go in the menu, book, go to new guest session, and hand it to them, and then they can browse all they want. They don't have access to your history data, and the moment they leave guest uh, mode, then also their stuff disappears. Okay, coming soon, so what's planned for next year or what is sort of now arriving in the stable versions of Firefox? The great Favicon rewrite. Um, so for new contributors, we, we tend to keep bugs apart, which we call good first bugs or mentored bugs, which are we think are re reasonably easy to tackle without in-depth understanding of how all of Firefox works where we also indicate like this is a person at Mozilla who can actively help you with this bug and you need to know this and this language to work on it. Um, 
<clears throat> this was one of those bugs who started like that, I think. And we had an intern over the summer who took this as his first assignment. So the problem we had was that we noticed that sometimes you would get uh, no favicon or a really crappy looking favicon uh, when browsing. And because you use favicons a lot and they're quite prominent in UI, that's a problem. So this intern started looking at that and after a while he came back. Um, it turns out technically the problem was that although Android unofficially supports .ico file decoding, which is the majority of favicons out there, it only supports some subformats there and it only decodes the first one. So that's the explanation why we would get the wrong favicon sometimes. So this intern, as part of his internship, writed, ended up writing an ICO decoder in Java, which I think is a very nice uh, thing you can do without having to know too much about Firefox. <clears throat> then when he was finished, he came back to us and said, you guys suck. Um, I looked at all the favicon code in, in Firefox Reinhardt, and it's a terrible mess. Like everything's converting from one format to the other. Uh, I mean, everybody just did, did ad hoc things while working on it. And he rewrote all the favicon code, so now it should work a lot better, a lot faster. Got nine high resolution icons. If there's not a high resolution icon, you like expand it by determining the dominant color. Now I've been wondering at this slide, like why is Google having a small icon? So we might still have some bugs there. Over scroll, we used to, if you like uh, swipe very clicky while scrolling, we would like bounce on and back. And well, at some point we realized that's a pretty silly gimmick, which is annoying after a while. So we got rid of it, and now there's just a small blue gradient that displays if you hit the page. Text selection, yeah, we have a, we cleaned up UI a bit, some more options, also share, and some small tweaks, like if you would press in the white space at the bottom of the page, old versions of Firefox would just like randomly select some text on a different part of the page, whereas now we don't do anything. That's all small tweaks which make the application easier to use. Uh, input type color, yeah, some, some HTML5 support where we display some UI now, where we didn't do before. Gecko view, that's actually uh, fairly important from the Mozilla perspective. So at some point during Firefox development, we gave up on making Gecko, the rendering engine, embeddable to be able to advance faster. But this meant that it was really, really difficult for anyone but Mozilla to use Gecko in their project and WebKit came and gobbled up that entire market and also nobody but us is really able to make a Firefox UI right now. And this is a problem. Um, on Android, so we are doing a lot of effort to make a Gecko embeddable again. We already did some of this work because our UI is completely separate from, from the rendering parts. And we hope that this first makes it easy for people to embed a modern HTML5 engine even on applic in applications, even if they're running on older Android phones but also to like experiment with some new UI stuff. We've been breathing a bit on like making a Firefox that's more usable for, for children. And we noticed some part of the community that would be interested in a Firefox that's like really privacy focused, includes store by default. Um, I'm not saying we're gonna do this, but the hope is that Gecko View makes this more feasible for someone to actually do. Um, other features, APK synthesis. So I showed you that web apps have this icon thing. But if you would go into applications on your Android device, you wouldn't see the web app because it's not a real Android application. We made it so that Firefox actually generates an APK, installs that, and it's a completely seamless experience compared to a native app. Firefox accounts, that's the new sync stuff. Um, basically change them somewhat complicated for most people, um, sync accounts with a regular username password uh, system. Tab streaming. That's a WebRTC feature, basically. Instead of using your camera, you can also use a tab as a video short source and then show someone what you're looking at on your phone. And PDF.js, because we currently don't have it on Firefox for Android. So uh, something the graphics team are working on at the moment is kind of consolidating all the rendering code. So some of the code that we introduced to make Android render faster, like the tiled rendering and low precision rendering and so on. Uh, we're trying to get that used in other platforms, say Firefox OS and Windows. And part of that work is not just making the code work on those other platforms, but tidying it up and optimizing it. So Android's going to benefit from that. But we also have some Android-specific work in the pipeline as well. So in Android KitKat, there are some new uh, APIs that let us, let us render to texture faster. So we're going to be using those. And 
I don't know, hopefully in a not too far future, you'll see some rendering speed ups. I've also recently made some page load uh, speed ups, mainly from, um, we had a quite inefficient uh, loading spinner renderer, and we've replaced, in, re replaced that with a loading bar, which has, in some cases, especially for older devices, quite dramatically improved page load speed, which is kind of surprising. Um, and we have these other features that we're, we've done as well, um, more gestures, updated download manager, better form filling, and so on. And that's it. And I think we're out of time as well, but maybe we've got, have we got time for a question? Just one, if you want. One question. So if anyone has a fantastic question, <laughs> now's the time. Okay, there's, there's a fantastic question over there. Can you what, sorry? Well, we, we demoed it last year, so I would rather not do this again. Also, because The question was, can we demo WebRTC? And I think the answer is not really right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe one more? One more. Last one. So the question was, how much Java code are we writing for it for the whole browser? So how Android dependent is like, the new features, um, new graphics features aren't at all. I mean, I guess in terms of how it works is we have Gecko, which is all native code pretty much, and then we have an Android interface, and then we have some callbacks that happen within Gecko that we then implement in Java, but those same callbacks are then implemented natively for other platforms. Basically, the render isn't Android specific at all, uh, just the UI, which is completely Android specific. Thanks a lot.